Selective is a vintage fashion store here in Charleston. The store is well known for its constantly changing supply of vintage clothes and streetwear. They are also known for putting on the widely popular 8-4 Flea, a well-known vintage flea market in Charleston. Today, we have Cistern Yard Fashion Magazine's own Tyler McCormick interviewing one of the founders, Gray McKendrick, as he talked about how Selective got its start and how the store has expanded the Charleston vintage scene. No, no hard hitters yet. Um, <laughs> but first, I definitely would love to hear a little bit about like the Selective story. Like, how did you guys get it started? How has it grown since you um, began? And yeah, just like a little bit of background. Uh, so it started. Uh, I started selling clothes personally when I was like fourteen, so like ten years almost. Yeah. And uh, Luke, my partner, probably selling. I mean, he probably started around the same time. But we met when we were like seventeen. Uh, we didn't go to high school together, but we met on like a Facebook group for shoes. And uh, we both were selling vintage at the time. And then uh, I joined him and his cousin. They were doing something out of a uh, out of like a garage in Luke's backyard. So we'd have like pop ups there. It was, it was like having a miniature store. I could show you pictures of it later. <laughs> but um, so yeah, we basically did that for a while. And then. Um, when Selective Hype was opening, the two guys who started it um, came to us at Run It Back, which is what the garage was called, is what we were calling it at the time. And uh, they basically wanted us to, like, sell to them everything. So they wanted to, like, us to source for them. So, like, it's like they're opening. Like, we sourced, like, all their vintage and Supreme and whatnot and Bape for them, like, when they first opened. And then uh, when they eventually did get fully open and stuff, I stayed with them as an employee for, I guess, two years. And then uh, shit went down the drain, basically, with, like, the owners and, and whatnot. And then, like, it was just me and Luke. And then uh, we were just managing it for, like, minimum wage. <laughs> like, it was horrible. It was the worst. It was cool because, like... Like you work at like the coolest place basically, but like you were getting treated like shit. It was it was horrible. <laughs> and then uh yeah, and then some other shit happened with the other owner and fired Luke because he thought Luke stole like thirty thousand dollars in cash, which was just not possible. There's never more than like two hundred dollars in the register at a time. But yeah, so then I stayed and I was working like sixty five hours a week by myself for like six months. It was horrible. And then that was like right around COVID. So we were actually like trying to buy the business off of the other dude because like it was kind of like our child at that point because like I mean we had been working there by ourselves for a year and a half pretty much so we wanted it we didn't want it to just close down but COVID happened and we we're like it's probably not a good idea to you know like take out a loan right now so <laughs> so we didn't end up doing it and then uh, I started saving up my unemployment checks with COVID because I mean you were getting like eight hundred fifty dollars a week really so. $850 a week for doing nothing for three months. I did pretty pretty good. So I used my money uh, basically to start this, and Luke had some money of his own, and that's how this came to be. So we opened in September 20. Where do you guys, where are you guys sourcing now? Like what can people look forward to when they come in and shop? Uh, so back then, we were one of the very few people who were like, actually like kind of thrifting I guess it was I mean at like 2015 16 17 18 I mean it was more of a hobby for us but like I just I just did it a lot so I was like I was always at thrift stores and stuff so it was like when you're the only one there I mean you're pretty much finding everything you know so it's like we were really fortunate enough to find a lot of shit all the time so that is basically just how we source it's just like doing it like the old-fashioned way so uh, that's the old fashioned way now, actually, it's just, it's kind of weird to think about, but as the years went on, it just got harder and harder as more people got into it because, you know, it's like when you're in a thrift store by yourself looking for five things, it's like you find the five things if you're by yourself, but if there's 20 people looking for the same five things, like you're just kind of fucked really. So it's like, we're, we're fortunate enough again to be close with like a lot of the people that do thrift and stay at the thrift stores for 12 hours a day so we buy off of them like whatever they get really and then you know uh we host the flea too so we're able to buy off of vendors there and stuff so in terms of like what people can look forward to in here it's just like it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing but like we really just curate shit for ourselves i think <laughs> like stuff that we think is cool whether it be like i mean uh, we've kind of moved away from sports because it was getting a little redundant. But 
I mean, like, you know, we like music and just, like, random graphic shirts. I like shirts that are comfortable. I think if it's a comfortable shirt, I'll buy it. I don't care what it looks like, really. So it's, like, I mean, like, most of our stuff that we sell is, like, 15 to $25 shirts, the best anyway. So it's, like, anything that's cool, really. I don't know. But it just depends on what you think is cool, I guess. So. So you mentioned starting 8 for Flea. I would love to hear a little bit about that process, like where did you guys see a need and uh, like just decide to go fill it? Like what was the exigence for uh, creating 8 for Flea and like how did that process come about? So when we initially started that, it was, Luke, it wasn't really me. I'll be honest up front, I didn't want to do one at all. I thought it's a lot of work a lot of like uh people you know what i mean i don't like really dealing with people too much when it comes to like repetitive things i guess and luke really wanted to do it but you know it's like that's my partner so it's like whatever he wants to do like i'm gonna do it with him you know what i mean so um it was initially just gonna be like like on like a random sunday like in here and then like in our parking lot and like we were gonna try and get like a food truck in the parking lot so it probably would have been like 10 vendors and we didn't even have a name for it but then we were talking to uh who was i don't even remember who it is it's not even really important but he was friends with amy from red rose and they came in together one night and we were talking to her about it and she kind of was interested in it so we asked her if she wanted to do it with us and uh she and her boyfriend came up with the name so give credit to her and i got i got to give credit to her for pretty much all of it she does a lot of the work for it uh so i don't want anybody to think it's like mainly us because i mean we basically just have the name and we do like things behind the scenes and i do like the flyers and all the graphic design for it and stuff like that so that's what we do <laughs> pretty much in the stuff of the day but we talked with her about it and she had uh she lives like across the street from tradesmen so she was friends with tradesmen and stuff so um it was possible to do it there, and it's a lot bigger than what we were going to do in here. Yeah. And Luke was really interested in it. I won't say I was because I just don't like that type of stuff. But uh, realistically, like, if we were looking at it from the perspective that we discussed, like, when we were creating it, like, there's other vintage markets in the area, but there wasn't, like, a 80s, 90s, 2000s T-shirt market. So it's like, we're like, maybe we could fill that void. Maybe it would be pretty cool. So... We planned to do one, and it was way more successful than we thought. Like it was like, it was like way bigger than what we thought it was gonna be. So it's like, okay, well now we gotta do another one, and then the next one was way bigger than the first one. It just it just kept growing, and it's like, it was nothing that we were necessarily prepared for, and it's like it just kept growing. I remember when we were when uh, when we were planning the first one, uh, we thought that like we were just gonna like post on our Instagrams and have it or whatever, and then like Amy made an Instagram for it, and I was so mad. I'm like, this account is never gonna have like fucking more than 300 followers because it's like who cares i was like this is so stupid and now it's like about to hit like 10,000 probably like at the end of this month so it's like it's just it's just crazy to see how wrong i was but yeah but i don't know like it's cool like um i think it's really good for the vendors um because there wasn't like a place for the people that like sell to us to necessarily have events unless they were going to go to like thrift con you know you got to travel to like these big cities to do that kind of stuff so it's like I'm glad that they kind of have a place to do it. Um, I don't know. I don't want to say it's like giving back to the community because that's kind of like pretentious. But like, I don't know. Like, it's just, it's, it, it is too. But like, I mean, I guess you kind of have to be. I don't know. That's so cool too because when I think about like the vintage scene in Charleston, especially when I first came to Charleston, like the two names that I thought of were Red Rose Vintage and Selective. So like seeing you guys come together and like work on a project that has been so successful has been really cool. Um, just as like somebody who has been a fan of both of you guys for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned like, I mean, the absolute blowout breakout success of 8 for Flea. Um, what do you guys attribute that to? Like, do you think it's sort of your location here in Charleston? Uh, like the product being available there and nobody else like why does it have such a draw like I mean I take off work for eight for flea like <laughs> and I know I'm not the only one so I know that people like are out there and like really love it so I would love to hear you, from your perspective why you think that is I don't know <laughs> I really don't I I guess because like it's just kind of like different 
Um, I think it draws a lot of vendors because it's still one of the cheapest markets to do around, it, like, despite the success of it. Like, I mean, uh, <laughs> the there's a market in Charlotte, which we're not on good terms with that guy because he kind of fucked us over. Mm-hmm. I won't really go into details with that. But, like, he's charging, like, $250 a booth. We charge 95 yeah. And it's, like, he has 60 vendors, so it's, like, there's not – enough money to go around pretty much you know so i think uh we could have way more than 40 vendors yeah. but it's like you kind of want to have like it, we, we it's mostly like a vendor i should have said this a lot earlier but it's a vendor centered market like we plan to do things for the vendors rather than the consumer i guess is kind of the way we look at it so it's like we want to like um make sure the vendors have enough stuff to go around you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, cause like, why would you want to go to a market, pay two hundred fifty dollars to get in? You're sharing the spot with seventy other people. You probably yeah. make like six hundred bucks, and then you're driving to Charlotte. Right. Here, like, you can come here, you spend ninety five bucks, mm-hmm. you can make three grand. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Cause you're there's a lot more money to go around. So, that's kind of one thing. Um, now, if I were to be specific about the consumers, we we're really specific about who we pick. You know what I mean? Like, we have like. 150 applications every time so it's like yeah for a vendor application so it's like we're we're narrowing 150 to 40 so it's like we're picking the best of the best of the best and we focus primarily on having local people you know but we try to get in like a good refresh you know what i mean so i mean we've heard about uh you we've heard you touch on uh selective and like the growth and eight for flea as well i mean those by themselves are two huge accomplishments so i would love to hear um, like what's coming down the pipeline for you guys? Do you have a secret next big project that's gonna revolutionize the Charleston vintage scene again, or uh, are we just gonna keep on plugging? What do you think? Uh, I don't have anything in mind. I don't think Luke has anything in mind either. Um, we're just coasting right now. I was gonna say. I mean, I, I'm gonna be honest. I don't know how much longer I want to do this, just because yeah. I've been doing this. I've been selling vintage clothes for ten years. Yeah. Ten years is a long time to do anything, and you know, it's like. The communities, they can be pretty toxic at times in terms, you know what I mean? It's like I'm tired of talking about clothes all the time, you know what I mean? Like I like I like talking about other things. So it's like, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and be like big things coming soon because there's none. So, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I just hate lying. That's okay. I love the honesty. Well, uh, thank you so much for um, sitting down with us today and talking a little bit about your journey. Um, Yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you.